Our world is a dark place, and as followers of Jesus, we are faced with a choice. We can throw our hands up in defeat and settle for what is, or we can choose to see what could be if we were to actually live by His example. What could our world look like if each of our lives were to display the values of Jesus? Join us as we ask the question, what if, and catch a vision of what our world could be. We live in a day and age of information, don't we? There's information everywhere. We can learn everywhere. And so I wanted to start by asking us a few simple questions and just get a show of hands here. Um, how many of you guys have learned something or read something in a physical book this week? Could be a textbook, could be fiction or nonfiction. Okay, a lot of people have read out of the book this week. How many of you have learned something from a podcast this week? Raise your hand. Could be true crime, could be leadership, could be a sermon, I don't know. How many of you have read something from a written blog on the web? How many of you read a blog this week? Okay. How many of you, let's go old school, newspaper or a magazine? How many of you read a newspaper or a magazine? To, not as many, okay. And then a YouTube or a reel? Like how many of you watched a YouTube video or a reel? Okay, times are changing. So lots of different ways to gain information, right? But we all kind of intuitively know there's a difference between learning and getting information and actually applying it, right? And actually doing what it says. Think about a doctor. If a doctor were to go to school, they were to spend all that time, all that energy, delaying some plan, spending a lot of money, and spending a lot of years going to be a doctor, but they never actually went and worked at a practice or never actually put a scalpel in their hands. Like, what is it worth? All that knowledge, but not actually acting on it. That's why today we're talking about the value of doing stuff, turning what we are learning into action. Because when we picked these values about 10 years ago, we sat down, picked these six values. We want these six values to shape our church. Um, we noticed a trend that we can all fall into, myself included. And that trend is that as Christians, we can learn a whole lot about Jesus, but sometimes we struggle to do what he says. Or we can equate following Jesus to a set of beliefs we have, a box we check, as opposed to seeing it as a way of life. Whenever Jesus called himself the way, earlier Christ followers called themselves the way because they understood it was a way of living. And that's why do stuff matters. It's our call to right those natural tendencies we have. And so some of you may hear me talking about doing stuff and you're sitting here like, okay, they're gonna ask me to do something. And, and your brain is already reeling and trying to, and like, you're like, I don't have time, right? I just wanna ask you to pause that uh, mental parade that's happening in your mind right now um, and just ask you to, to sit in today because I do believe that doing stuff God's way, it, it is this beautiful space where our inside affections match up with our outside actions and it's an overflow of following Jesus, not out of obligation, not out of earning anything. And so I want you to come with me on this journey. Well, there is a theological reality that today is built on and that is the truth that God created us to do stuff. Doing stuff is in our created nature. When you say created nature, it's how God created, designed us, right? When we look at he is the ultimate designer, the ultimate creator, he created humans to do stuff. It comes out of Genesis, it says this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. We're gonna come back to that later. They will reign, other, um, verse, other um, translations say rule, reign, rule. It's a very kingdom language, but they will work. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the animals on the earth, and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. We were made to work. We have agency, we have the ability to think, to create. We were designed to be co-creators, co-laborers with Christ in perfect unity with God. That is the original intent in the Garden of Eden. But as I say that, you and I know that that's not how things stayed, right? It entered sin, entered the fall, and now sin has changed our motivations for doing stuff, right? A lot of times we think we need to do stuff to earn God's approval. We need to do stuff to get his love whenever we already have it. Or we need to do stuff to keep earning our salvation, but, but it says by grace alone that we are saved, no works save us. And, and so there again, we see even sin coming into how we do stuff as Christians or even in the world. We do stuff and we usually like we succeed, we wanna be productive, we wanna get stuff done and we usually do it for our name, for our glory, for our reputation, 
And again, that's a perversion of how God designed it to be for his name, for his glory, right? So sin has changed a lot of our motivations, and so it's important to kind of see this, this tension that exists in all of us in this day and this age. So doing stuff God's way is not trying to earn anything for ourselves or from God. That's a summary of what I just said. But doing stuff God's way, it's simply our faith in action. It's simply the overflow, not out of earning anything, not out of trying to be enough or do enough. Your worth is not changed by how much stuff you do. do don't hear me say that today. It is an overflow. In the same way, when you go to a restaurant and you have a really good experience, you may tell a friend about it. You may post a picture and you know, throw it on your Insta story. You may, you may put, do a five-star Google review. You may go back the next week because it was so good and you just can't help it, right? Whenever you have an experience you enjoy, it's an overflow to talk about it, to tell your friends about it, to go back. It's not an obligation. That was always meant to be. Doing stuff was always meant to be an overflow out of what God has done. We cannot help but do what he calls us to do. James 1 is kind of redefining faith for us. So I want you to go on this journey with me. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceives yourself, right? Don't just, don't just hear another sermon. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he walks away and he forgets, right? He, he saw something, he was exposed to something, but he didn't actually change his life. It goes on to say, but whoever looks intently, intently, purposefully, into the perfect law that gives freedom, oh, beautiful description of the word, and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in all they do. Faith without deeds is dead. That's dramatic language, but he's calling us to redefine faith here. Not faith as a noun, something you have or don't have, a box you've checked or a prayer you've prayed or not prayed, but faith as action, faith as a way of life. As Christ followers, we're, we can be part of this movement of the way. And I have to be honest with you guys, this has actually been a realization that I've been having over the last five years that I have probably have this foundational belief of faith that's not quite complete. Uh, you see, I grew up with a, a, a model of like saying yes to Jesus. It was called the ABC prayer. Some of you guys may have heard the ABC prayer. Some of you may not have at all, um, but I'll, I'll tell you briefly what it is. It's A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is God's son. He died on the cross for your sins. And C, confess. Confess that you need him. Pray right there. A, B, C. And then you our person of faith. Well, the problem with that is it's not wrong, it's just incomplete. I almost wish instead of the C being confessed, the C was for commit because it is because of what God has done, now I'm committing my whole life to you, not just someday that I get to go to heaven, but my whole life is yours. And so I have been relearning this definition of faith and that the action, the obedience part, I would have said it's important, but I would have said it was after, right? But the action is not after we have faith. It's not a follow-up. It's not to be a good Christian, to do enough. Action is actually interconnected with faith. It, it's the genuineness of our faith that really and truly to have faith in someone is to be willing to act. Think of this. If you have a doctor, he's recommending a surgery. You say you have faith in him, but you're never actually willing to go under the knife and trust him. Do you have faith in that doctor? You see, when we say we have faith in someone, if it's genuine faith, there is action. It's not an after the thought, it's an interconnected with. The word faith was always meant to be action, a verb, right? Not a noun. And now that's not to say that you're never gonna wrestle with something God is telling you to do. I'm just redefining this core belief that some of us may have had. And so I wanna pause here and ask you a couple questions. And these questions are only helpful to you if, you if you want to genuinely think about them, genuinely reflect. I'm not gonna hear your answer, but like me, maybe your definition of faith has been misleading you. So what do you believe about faith? When you think of a person of faith, do you think of a set of beliefs, theological beliefs that they would hold? Do you, do you think of um, beliefs that they would hold? Do you think of a box they have checked or a prayer they would prayed? Right, we've talked through that. Or a different question that's kind of connected. Why do you come to church on Sunday? Do you come for content? Do you come for more knowledge? Do you come to grow deeper with God? 
And those things were not bad, right? But what if we re-envisioned our perspective of faith? We restoried what it means to be people of faith, that it's not beliefs we have or don't have, because then we kind of get into trouble being belief police. But what if instead, the way of faith, people of faith were a people that they showed up on a Sunday morning, yes, to connect with God, but so that they could go change how they lived? What if we assumed every single Sunday we gathered together with the body of Christ, not alone, it's different when we gather together. What if we showed up to connect with God, knowing we were gonna change how we lived Sunday evening, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday evening? What if we showed up asking ourselves and we left asking ourselves, so what am I gonna do about it? And we really trained ourselves that faith always resulted in action, not obligation, not earning, but it is the overflow. I just think it's a different mentality. So as we talk about how we were created to do stuff and there's this tension of sin always pulling us away to do it for our name, I wanna look at the kind of stuff God made us to do. What kind of stuff did he design us to do? I think he designed us to do stuff that brings his kingdom here on earth. And again, this is kingdom language. It's very Old Testament, but it's kind of connected to that concept of ruling and reigning that I talked about in Genesis 1. But before we got to God saying we were created to reign, prior to that, he said we were made in his image. If you think of an image, if I was to pull up a picture of my kids, and I'd love to if we were having a conversation, uh, if I was to pull up a picture of them, that image of them on my phone is not the real thing. An image is a reflection of the real thing. We were meant to then, as we reign, were we meant to reflect ourselves or are we meant to reflect God? We are made in his image, and so whenever we work, whenever we use the life that God has been given us, we were meant to do it in God's image, for his image, making how he would want the world to look here on earth. It's why Jesus taught his followers to pray. In Matthew 6, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you think of heaven, it's like the Garden of Eden, back in full effect, heaven when all things are right again, when the world is right again, when it is whole and complete and God fully dwells with his people. Heaven is the perfect picture of shalom. Shalom is a Hebrew word and it means peace, but not not just peace as a feeling. Oh, it means so much more than that. It means peace as wholeness as everything being in its right place, as a relationship operating as it should, your home being everything, all the toys in the right places in the playroom, right? It is everything in its right place, that is shalom. And so what does it mean that we are called to bring about his kingdom and bring about heaven on earth? It means that heaven is not just about a someday thing. It's not just a destination someday. Instead, it's about bringing his kingdom on earth today. It's not just a a, a box you've checked, because when we check the box, then we're done and we're good, right? And that can be an excuse to keep our head in the sand or to holy huddle. But instead, we were called to make not, not heaven a someday thing or only a someday thing. We were called to make it a today thing. That in our little slice of the world, it matters to make things right, to bring about shalom, to make it on earth as it is in heaven. That when there's a need, we meet it. That when there's a wrong, we help right it. That whenever there's brokenness, we bring about healing. Whenever there's enslavement, we bring about freedom. Whenever there's a broken relationship, we help mend it. When there's despair, we give hope. It's making our little slice of the world just a little bit more like heaven. And it can sound like this series is a whole lot about the world and a whole lot about other people, but there's a twist in God's gracious design. You see, when we put our faith in action, it doesn't just bring about God's kingdom for others. (laughs) It also brings about God's kingdom within us, within you. We heard it in the video earlier, Micah and Ryan, they talked about how whenever they started serving, they thought it was for other people, but really like it ended up being for them. And actually social science backs this up because social science would say that sometimes our habits or most of the time our habits inform our mindset a lot more often than the other way around. Think about this. If you start working out again, right? And that's your action, that's your habit, you're gonna work out again. Well, that action, that habit, it changes how you think, doesn't it? Because then suddenly you're worried about how much water you're drinking and you're ordering the giant water bottle on Amazon that's tracking how much water you're drinking. Or maybe you're thinking about the food you're eating or maybe you're thinking about how to fit working out into your day. You see those, ha- those habits, those actions, they informed our mindset, they informed our thinking. 
I think a lot of times as Christ followers, we focus so much on our mindset and so much on our thinking that we miss that God shapes us by our actions. Uh, Take, for instance, the desire to grow deeper. We say sometimes we want to grow deeper. I want deeper sermons. I want deeper Bible studies. I want deeper quiet times with God. I want deeper. But in reality, what we mean is we want more knowledge, more content. We have content at our fingertips. And I wonder if we've gotten it backwards. Yes, know God. (laughs) Yes, study God. Absolutely. Yes, love God. But also, know your neighbor. Study your neighbor. Love your neighbor and trust that those things form you, those things shape you. We say our mindset that we wanna love our neighbor, but until we do it, we're not fully changed. You see, this whole concept of doing stuff, it was meant to disciple us, not just for the world. And then it makes it a beautiful, mutual relationship too. As I was thinking about this, Isaiah 61 came to mind. It's a beautiful passage. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. And because the Lord has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives, right? He's bringing about shalom, making things right, and releasing from darkness for the prisoners. (laughs) People that do that, they will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting, not for their image, but a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Think about a giant oak tree. It has deep roots. The deeper we're craving is there, but those deep roots don't stop there. Those deep roots lead to deep and great shade and care and protection. People that come under that beautiful canopy of branches and leaves, they are protected, they are refreshed, they are cared for, that our deep roots should always lead for deep care to others. They go hand in hand. It's why doing stuff matters. It's not just for the world, it's also for us too. Doing stuff, it makes a difference. It's the difference between a Sunday morning sermon, staying on Sunday, and it impacting our Monday. It's the difference between a Christian life that's all about me, but opens our eyes to look at the we, both in the body of Christ and in the world. Doing stuff redefines deeper as not just a set of beliefs or more knowledge, but actions that reach out wide. Doing stuff is not just about more content in, it's about an overflow that leads out. It's not about heaven someday, it's about bringing heaven about today. It's from me to we, in to out, deep and wide. They work together, they partner together, doing stuff. It is a beautiful overflow of our faith, not obligation, not trying to earn anything from God, but that we would align our outside actions with our inside affections. Doesn't that sound beautifully integrated? There's freedom there when our life is integrated like that, that we're the same person in and out. It's simply the testimony of a transformed life. It's simply our faith in action. And so what does it look like for us to do stuff in the world I have three application points that I want to walk through. The first is embrace the power of meeting a need. And what I mean by this is that sometimes I think we can separate a person and we can separate the buckets they have in their life, that there's the spiritual needs and the physical needs and the emotional needs, and we separate them and we make them different and distinct. But I want to reclaim the power of meeting those physical and emotional needs because I am one person, right? You are one person. All those things are still part of you. And so we separate the spiritual out and I think we miss the power of meeting some of those needs. Here's what I mean. Take a look at how Jesus spoke. He was talking about the end of times actually and he says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, right? Meeting physical needs. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous, right? They're like, wait a second. We didn't, we didn't see you were thirsty. Lord, We didn't see you hungry and feed you. We didn't see you thirsty and give you something to drink. When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes? When did we see you sick? When did we go visit you? And Jesus responds, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. And you see, I think if we were to serve other people the way that we would serve Jesus here in the flesh, we would bring a little bit more heaven on earth, wouldn't we? 
because God calls us to serve the least of these. He's not talking about the people that you get along with and who are like you. He's talking about the people that needed clothing, the people that needed food, the people that were prisoners. Uh, you see, neighbor, love your neighbor, in, in the New Testament really means anyone that's in proximity with you. It doesn't mean those that are like you. Serve them the way God called us to serve. And you see, I think that would change things, that the spiritual is not separate. And, and see, Jesus was meeting these physical needs and, and meeting these, these emotional needs in connection with the spiritual. He didn't see them as opposite or as competing. And I have to wonder, if people are not receptive to their spiritual need, is it because there's an emotional or a physical need that's clouding their ability to see that spiritual need? I think about today's current mental health crisis. If you haven't heard of it, uh, counselors are reporting that mental health is at an all-time low, that anxiety and depression are at an all-time high, suicides are at an all-time high. There is a mental health crisis happening in this day and age, unlike any before. And I think there's a generation looking at the church saying, I hear you care about my soul, but do you care that I couldn't get out of bed this morning because my depression is so debilitating? Do you care that I can't come into church because I have a panic attack every time that I try? Or maybe it's a single mom saying, I hear you care about my soul, church, but do you care that I'm working two jobs and I can barely put food on the table? I hear you care about my soul, says the parent of a child with special needs, but do you care that I haven't been on a date night in 10 years because I can't find someone who can watch my kids? You see, I think our spiritual needs are not separate from the rest of us. We are an integrated person. And I think Jesus knew that. The entry point to the spiritual conversation we so long to have and know we should have might not be a spiritual conversation. It might be a meal or a hug. Sometimes a hug in the midst of deep grief can be the most spiritual thing a person can receive. Except if they're not a hugger, then don't hug them. <laughs> know your person, read your room. <laughs> I think we're just called to meet needs because Jesus met them to learn relationships because Jesus made relationships and not as a trade, not I'm gonna meet this need for you and then I'm gonna open up a tract and share about Jesus, right? Not as a trade, but as trusting the evolution of a relationship. And yes, I pray you get to talk about Jesus, but my goodness, start with where their needs are and see the power of that. The second thing is starting where God has planted you. Where God has planted you. I think we can look at all the needs in the world. I can look on Instagram and see all the needs in the world and I can get overwhelmed. Does my one little bit of good make a difference? Or we can like kind of basically stop before we even get started because we can't even imagine. Like God says, he so loved the world. And we start thinking about the world and all that that means. And we're like, that's a lot of love. That's a lot of love to give. But God did so love the world and we are called to care for the world. But what does he tell us to do? He says, love your neighbor. You see, God so loved the world and you're called to love your neighbor, right? He narrows it down to where you are planted. In 2022, in this season, whether you wanna be in this season or not, you are where you are on purpose and for a purpose. Where you are planted is part of your assignment to bring heaven on earth. Don't miss it. This is just seeing every single day as an opportunity to make it a little more like heaven right? Your workplaces, your communities, your gym, your golf courses. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Your third places. It's seeing that as part of, as part of your assignment. But a lot of times we can miss it. In psychology, it's, it's called the bystander effect, that there's so many people that we just assume someone else has got it. I grew up going to my sister's volleyball games, and so I think of a volleyball example here, even though I am not a volleyball player. But what would happen sometimes is a ball was coming over the net and all the girls would yell, I got it, I got it. And the whole team would yell it. So then the whole team would step back because like someone else has got it, right? And then you watch the ball come over and they all yell, they've got it, but no one's got it, right? And it's that kind of moment. And I think we can do that as Christians. Oh, there's so many needs in the world and we get overwhelmed, but start where you're planted. If you see a need, assume it's yours to meet. If you see a wrong, assume it's yours to help make right. We overthink it, we overcomplicate it, we second guess it, but what if you assumed you are where you are on purpose? How would that change how you showed up? Because I happen to believe that you are perfectly equipped to do the good work he has planned for you. I believe this. Ephesians 2.10 says that you are God's masterpiece. You're not just a little bit awesome. 
you're a lot awesome. You are God's masterpiece, that you were created anew in Christ Jesus, made to do good works which he created in advance for you, that whenever you were born, God knew what he hoped you would do with your divine assignment, and it was tailored to you, not to the person next to you, not to the person to your right or your left or your spouse or your roommate, but for you. So you're like, oh, I'm pretty introverted. Okay, your divine assignment is connected to that. Oh, I'm, into, I'm not into sports. I can't talk about sports with those people. Okay, your divine assignment is not connected to that. Your divine assignment is connected to you. You are perfectly equipped. Assume where you're planted is on purpose. And the third, it's, it's not complicated. It's just use what you have. <laughs> use what you have in front of you. When you look at what you have, everything we have from God is a gift. And what you have is a, can be a tool in order to make it a little more like heaven here on earth. When you look at Jesus feeding the 5,000, what did he start with? Fishes and loaves, just a few, right? He started with a few physical things and, and yeah, it wasn't enough. Well, don't worry because he's got access to the whole supernatural spectrum of things. And so our human starting point is not God's supernatural ending point. Praise God for that. So just use what you have. And don't underestimate what God can do with your human starting point. Don't second guess it, don't overthink it. If you've got something to give, use it. And I thought of a few specific examples before I lose you and you think, well, I can't do that, I, I'm not rich, me neither. But God can still use us. There are still plenty of tools that we can use. So is it a physical tool? Is it a meal? You don't have to have a full fancy meal or your favorite meal to take to someone. You can just split what you're making for dinner that night. Do you have some extra blankets? Can you throw some in the back of your car? It's cold right now. If you pass someone on the street that maybe doesn't have a home, can you share a blanket? Is it mowing a lawn while someone's out of town? Is it a repair? Is it something physical? Or is it knowledge, right? Is it knowledge to share? Maybe you've been in your industry for a long time or maybe you've just walked through a unique time and you have something to share. You can mentor that new person. Is it a service or a skill? I knew a volunteer in Trail Kids. She was a financial planner and she came across another volunteer who was in a hard time and she just offered to meet with her, right? And she can't do that for everyone because she makes a living off of that, but she can do it for a few. Can you do that for a few? Maybe it is financial. Maybe you hear someone that needs their water bill paid and you can pay it, right? Look at what you have. Maybe it's giving to the GoFund. Maybe it's your influence, right? Using your voice, your position. Maybe you've been somewhere a long time. Maybe you're the, the, the person of majority in your workplace or in your community and you can use that to help bring about change. Or maybe it's emotional, it's encouragement, right? A note, a text, a prayer. Someone shared at a birthday party, their spouse was just diagnosed with cancer. You can follow up with a text and let them know they didn't share in a vacuum. You see, most of these things don't cost us money. Most of these things we would view as small, but they are not small, right? Because God's supernatural end point is not ours. Praise Jesus for that. And also, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking of a few resources we have as a church that you can use. So sometimes it's not a resource you have, but you can be a connector to someone else or to some other organization. So there's a couple websites that I just want you to keep in mind. Preston.org slash help. Um, this is a website I just want you to keep in mind when you encounter someone who needs help. Super simply named. But on here, right, you hear about someone who is walking through a miscarriage or infant loss. Well, we have a support group for that. There's a whole list of support groups. Maybe you can connect them so they're doing life in community in that hard time. Maybe they need a counselor. There's a list of counselors here. Hey, my church has a list of counselors. Here you go, right? Or maybe the, the, their marriage is in trouble and, and they need to be a part of a community working on their marriage. We have that. Maybe they, they need to have a funeral and they don't have a church home. We'd love to see if we can do that right? There's financial assistance, local assistance, which includes like um, homeless shelters and things like that. There are resources here, right? I know this is a long list, but I want you to know you have more at your disposal than maybe you realize. And if you go to our YouTube page, which that red button connects you, maybe it's sharing a message or maybe you're not there yet. Maybe it's sharing some marriage help or some parenting help. They're talking about the birds and the bees conversation. We have a video for that, right? I'm giving you a lot of examples because I hope you hear me say, your starting point matters. What you have in front of you matters. It's all a tool to be a part of making his image known, making his view of the world known. And it's a beautiful view and it's a beautiful world he has envisioned and we get to be a part of that. So what if we stopped overthinking? What if we stopped second guessing? And what if we simply used what we have? Well, I want to share a story of someone who did just that. 
This is Liz Watson. She is a Preston trailer, and she is a part of founding an organization called Refresh Frisco. Refresh Frisco is one of our community partners that we're talking about, how our GoFund is, we're raising money to give it away to all these community partners. She's one of them. And she's a Preston trailer. She's a regular person, just like me and you. And she's been attending Preston 12 for the last seven years. She was volunteering in Frisco ISD and she had a front row seat to what was going on with some of these students. She saw people were helping meet these meal needs, these food needs, but she noticed no one was meeting their hygiene needs. And the more she thought about it, right, it was just a need she saw. The more she thought about it, she was like, well, man, self-confidence, self-esteem, bullying, mental health, like so much of that is connected to how do we feel about our body? And what if these students just had simple access to hygiene products? So, in 2019, she put together a, a business plan for a nonprofit organization, which is now Refresh Frisco. She met with Frisco ISD, and in 2019, she started with 200 students. 200 students that opted in and signed up, and they're given a kit, a hygiene kit, for the next three months. It should last them the whole three months. It's put together by gender, by hair and skin need, by the time of year it is, right? There's some sunscreen in there, and these packs are distributed, and that was 2019. And today, every quarter, she gets to be a part of giving a hygiene kit to 1,500 students across 84 schools in Frisco and Little Elm ISD. How incredible is that? And she's just a regular person, right? She saw a need and she assumed it was hers to meet. And talking about her, talking with her, uh, she started talking about how every single month, every single quarter, she just feels like her posture is to say yes, a yes posture, yes to this student, yes to this family, when oftentimes <laughs> she doesn't really know how it's all gonna work out. She doesn't really know if they have enough supplies to add those families, to add those students. And every single quarter, she says she feels God just saying, just say yes and trust me. And every single quarter, she has enough. Again and again and again. It's our starting point with God's ending point. It is beautiful. And as I think about this series, the series is called What If? We're just helping ourselves use our sanctified imagination to think about what the world could look like if we leaned in. But it's not just Liz's world, and I'm so thankful for her world, but it's our world. The tagline of this series says, catch a vision for what our world could be. And so most of us in the room are probably not gonna go start a nonprofit. Maybe you are, please do it. But most of us, right, meeting a need might look as simple as bringing a meal, closing a gap, meeting a need, caring where there needs to be caring for. And what if we all did that? What if we all did for a few what we wish we could do for everyone? What would God do in and through Preston Trail Community Church? You see, I have to hope and I have to wonder that instead of Christians being known for staying in their holy huddle and only caring about heaven someday, that Christians might become known for people that did stuff, that got in there whenever there was injustice, that got in there whenever there was a need that maybe people would call Christians first. Maybe Christians would be the first people to sign up when disaster hit. Maybe, just maybe, we would be known for turning what we were learning into action and making the world a better place. And we would know better place means a little more like heaven on earth. And so as we close today, I, I wanna end with this guided prayer moment. And so it's gonna be a couple minutes, and so settle in, get comfortable, but a guided prayer moment where I'm gonna kinda introduce a concept and say a few thoughts and then give you 20, 30 seconds to just respond to God as you feel led today. This is time between you and God. This is our time to practice what we've been talking about. And so I wanna start um, as we remember God's design. So go ahead and close your eyes if, you, if that makes you more comfortable. And, you know, lean over, if, however you get comfortable. So get comfortable. And I wanna start with remembering God's design. Doing stuff is in our created nature, the way the creator of heaven and earth made you. And doing stuff was not for our image or our name or our gain, not to earn salvation, not to earn his love, you have it, but as an overflow of our faith. So I wanna give you a moment to thank God for his design, that he designed you, specifically you, to do stuff. And if you need to confess some ways you've been doing stuff for your name, not for his, do so now.
heaven on earth. Not heaven someday, but heaven on earth today. I want you to imagine that where you are planted in your communities, in your schools, in your workplaces. What if things looked in their right order? What if people were whole? What if things were in their right place? Would you pray for those spaces and peoples and communities to be in shalom? Pray for shalom in the spaces you see, the places you're planted. Now I want you to take a look at what you have in front of you as a tool. Look at your story, your personality, your talents and abilities, your resources, both financial, emotional, physical. And I want you just to take note to what comes to mind. What do you, what do you feel God nudging you? What do you see in front of you as tools you have? And then lastly, I wanna practice the question we said earlier. So what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> Let's practice turning what we're learning into action today, together as a body, all of us doing our part. So how is God calling you to respond? Would you tell him now and then I'll pray us out. God, creator of the universe and creator of every single person within my hearing online and in the room. God, thank you for these prayers. Thank you for these hearts. I don't even know them. I, I can't read their minds, but yet I know you heard every single one of them. And so I thank you for them. I thank you for the enthusiastic yeses. I thank you for the hesitant, I'm not sure. I thank you for the, the closed fists that maybe are starting to unfold. And God, I know you meet us in all of those spaces, wherever we are, because you are good and you are gracious and you work with us as we slowly surrender our lives to you. And so God, I pray for this body of believers, Lord, that we may make our communities a little more like heaven on earth. God, I pray for neighborhoods where neighbors are known and needs are met. I pray for communities where no one is overlooked. I pray that maybe Christians would be known for people who go first, or they would call Christians first. They would call these wonderful brothers and sisters first. And Lord, in the process that these people, all of us may become a little more like you, your kingdom would come within us, not just on earth, but within us. And so God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to meet you. We hold what we have out in front of you and we ask you to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. We love you, in Jesus' name, amen.